Genius for life. Coconut smoothies coming at you. <laughs> Here we go. Hello there. Welcome to episode 93 of 15 Minutes of Genius. I am your humble, semi-genius, sometimes genius host, Alex Baer. I'm the CEO and founder of Genius Juice. So uh, we bring on awesome entrepreneurs, uh, people that have created great brands, great products, investors, consultants. We just had on a guy that is a number one company for putting advertisements on boxed trucks in the US. That was Neil Pecanino from episode 92. So awesome stuff there. So we bring on a wide range of people is what I'm trying to say. So before introducing our guest, I met this guy uh, about a year ago through the Shark Tank Connection. But before going into that, wanted to give a quick plug to Mark Nicholas, Mark N at ManhattanBeachStudios.net. There he is. He's like, what? Okay, there's the camera. There he is. So he's like, hey, you know, I'm doing my best over here. I'm doing my best. So I, I'm his internal monologue, right? I, I'm, I'm what's, my voice is what's in his head right now. And in the background, you have Rachel. She's a stage manager there. There you go. Wait, Rachel. There you are. But on your phone this time. Thank you. Thank you for looking at the camera. All right. Just giving you a hard time. All right. So again, uh, Mark N at ManhattanBeatStudios.net. They do editing, video, audio. Um, they do podcasting. They do everything. The, this whole set, it's all them. Mark built this wall behind me. So two, his two hands. All right. So our guest, uh, without further ado, John Soriel, he is the founder and managing partner of Tada Foods, which is, I, I love the name, like Tada. And they were on Shark Tank. Um, awesome appearance. A little bit about him. I'm going to do an intro from LinkedIn, trusty cell phone here. 10 years in, over 12,000 points of distribution and one successful Shark Tank appearance. He consider himself a seasoned food CPG entrepreneur who continues to grow, learn, and work through the ups and downs of building a lasting food brand. John, how's it going, my man? Good, man. How are you doing? Doing very good. I love the, uh, you know, the positive, you know, the positive messaging on the back. It says, I see love. I think there's probably uh, more to it. I see the love. Yeah. No, All it's about it's the always love. about love. Totally, man. For sure. What keeps the world go keeps the world going round. So... All right. We hope. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, uh, let's get into it. Um, you were on Shark Tank, right? And that was really cool. That's how we met the product itself. I'm always fascinated with how you created the product, right? I'm sure you've said this many, many times, um, that sure. it's a Middle Eastern influenced food. Um, yep. Tell us more about how you created this product, what makes it special, and uh, why do consumers love it, right? Tell us more about your story. So it's a uh, it's an it's actually a very interesting story because um, I grew up in the the food industry. My uh, my parents were you know and aunts and uncles. They were all in different forms. Uh, you know, food service, uh, delis. You know, fast casual. You know, fine dining. So it was always a part of my life. But you know, I went to to school for for engineering and uh, always had a I know it sounds cliche, but always had a passion for food. It was part of my upbringing and. Um, I really wanted, I had moved from the corporate space into the not-for-profit space. And it was when I was working in that not-for-profit space, I, I noticed they were spending an inordinate amount of time doing, you know, planning for fundraising events and galas, right? They'd spend like three months of the year and it was taking them away from the, the social work and, and the work that was, you know, impactful for the community, but they needed to raise money. And so I started looking into into social capitalism and, 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 and social ventures as a way to, to uh, invoke change in, in, in society. And, and, um, I originally had a completely different concept. I don't know how familiar you are with Greek or middle Eastern food, but there's a dish that, uh, Greeks call pasticcio and, uh, Egyptians call macarona bechamel. Anyway, I was looking for a co-packer and I was trying to get this concept off the ground and I was at my computer working and I was hungry. And so I just whipped up a, you know, a dish that I was familiar with, you know, which was uh, falafel and, but I didn't have any pita bread, which is typically served in pita bread with, you know, hummus and fresh veggies and stuff like that. But I had some tortillas laying around. So I threw it together and I sat there working one hand on my laptop and I was holding this uh, falafel burrito, if you will, in the other hand and I'm eating it. And, and, uh, and I'm, you know, halfway through, I was like, this is really good. So I took some and 
you know, I had some leftovers and threw them in the freezer. And the next day I, I threw them in the microwave and I said, wow, th this, this is actually a really good product. And uh, ended up pivoting, you know, in the early stages away from this other dish and decided to, to make the company, you know, plant-based focused. And, um, and it was, I think, a revelation for most consumers because, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to eat plant-based, and at the time people, you know, didn't call themselves plant-based. That's more of a, you know, more recent term. But, you know, you were really, you had Amy's Organic, which was the incumbent. Uh, and there was just like 30 different types of bean and cheese burritos or bean and rice burritos or some other type of bean burrito. And everyone who's eaten one of those out of convenience or, you know, in some cases, desperation, the first thing you do is you reach into the pantry and you grab your favorite hot sauce because you're trying to add some flavor to it. And the nutritionals on them weren't that good. And, you know, I, I put together, you know, three uh, flavors to start the, the, the company off with. And people would try them and we'd be in these meetings, we'd be at Expo West, and they're having like these Harry Met Sally moments, right? You know, they're banging on the table saying, this is, you know, did you just make this fresh? What is like, it, it, and I just realized that, you know, no one had taken the time to develop flavor focused foods, right? You know, the big CPGs, and you know this, Alex, you know, as, as, as well as anyone else out there, right? They look at things completely different, right? When they launch a product, it's gotta be out the gate, a hundred million dollar, you know, uh, product. And so, and that's great for, for entrepreneurs like ourselves, right? Because we could do things differently. So when I would go to our co-packers, um, I leaned heavily on, you know, my background in food, but also my, my engineering background. And I insisted that we not make it necessarily for optimal efficiency, but for optimal flavor. Like we weren't going to sub out fresh parsley for dried parsley. We weren't going to uh -huh. sub out, you know, fresh garlic for garlic powder. And they're like, well, your cogs are going to be too high. I was like, okay, well, you know, we're going to be a niche product to start anyway. And, you know, we'll worry about, you know, uh, our cogs, you know, we were worried, we, we always worried about our cogs, but we, we'll worry about lowering our price point as we mature and as we scale. Right. And so I think it's because we took, uh, approached the market differently and we gave people something that they hadn't been looking for, but they, they wanted it, right? You know, they thought that this was the best that frozen foods could be. And, and you know, we were early uh, in that and there were other companies like Sweet Earth who did a phenomenal job uh, went in the marketplace right around the same time and they scaled very quickly and we've just taken a much slower, methodic, more methodical, some people might say meandering approach, right? As we've, you know, learned some hard lessons and we never took on venture capital money uh, early on. You know, we just, we wanted to be self-funded for as long as we could and, and that obviously, you know, has some pros and cons to it. Yeah, and one thing, just kind of a takeaway from this first part you talked about, the, the history, creating the product, I'm a big believer too, right? You know, again, just shameless plug with the genius juice, right? And how we make this product the same way with Tada Foods, which you did not want to sacrifice with cheaper ingredients, easier to make, easier to store, shelf stable, um, you know, cheap, you know, just better cost of goods and all that. You started with the product and I'm a firm believer because more, more and more brands are coming out right? Like magic spoon, one box of magic mm -hmm. spoon online is $8. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and then I buy, you know, other brands of chocolate bars that are like hue that are $6. Right. But the quality is just amazing. And it keeps people coming back. And, you know, for entrepreneurs that are watching, right, or listening, that if you have a great quality product, you may not get the Kroger consumer, or the Albertsons to like buy 1000s of this, you know, in each store. But you're going to get that loyal consumer that's going to buy one person that's going to buy many of them because the quality and the flavor is great. So you're 10 years in, right? And this is like, you know, we, we like to ask the questions because I get the same questions, right? I'm seven years in with Genius Juice. Mm -hmm. What is your plan, right? Like you're growing, right? You know, revenue, all that stuff you raised on WeFunder mm -hmm. recently. We'll get into that as well. But tell us, yeah. what is kind of the big picture strategy with Tada, do you want to keep it going and maintain control? Do you eventually want to sell it? And how do you plan to get there? Since you know you're ten years in, you've been you've been doing this a while. What's your plan going forward? You know, it's funny because I came from the corporate space and I was uh, an executive uh, at a couple of large companies, and I came into it with a very strong strategic plan. And 
you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a fan of this Mike Tyson quote, which is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> Multiple times. So, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, my brother-in-law would tell me, you know, being a business owner is just like, you know, waiting to get kicked in the nads. Right. Uh, you know, you know, it's coming and you just, you know, just waiting for it to happen. Um, but there's some good things to it as well, but it, it is, I used to have this plan and think, okay, this is what I wanted to do. This is how I wanted to exit. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned is to not be too beholden to those plans because I want to stay flexible um, and keep myself open to what the future holds. So in the case of Tada, yeah, we, we would like to scale. We would like to really continue to to deliver innovative and high quality products not to overextend ourselves um and if and if that leads to an exit great um but you know we're also and i know this isn't very popular in our industry we are we're working on profitability and in fact years four and five of our company we were profitable which you know for a startup that's growing triple digits year over year um that's pretty rare, especially in the frozen space. Uh, it's pretty, it's become pretty common to, you know, what pe people like to refer to as pump and dump, right? People right. like to in a lot of cash, chase that top line revenue yep. and hope that they get acquired and the, the, the acquiring company will, will work out all the kinks. It's not, right? not working that way anymore. It's becoming more and more yeah, rare, right? Yeah, it is. It is. So we want to build something that is sustainable, uh, you know, and that's going to allow to da to live on and, and and continue to deliver value for consumers. So, yes, we would like to we would like to exit at some point. But you know, the market's changed, Alex. You know, you've got SPACs, you've got like all types of ways for companies to continue to fund their growth that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily involve being you know acquired. So, I think I'm keeping myself open. My goal is to to drive growth. Uh, and to continue to give consumers that to da moment, right? We just want people when they eat our, our stuff, we love getting DMs and Instagram posts of people like kind of like incredulously saying, I tried this on a whim and it's the best tasting thing I've ever had out of, out of frozen. Like this is, I'd rather have this than go to, you know, the restaurant down the street because it's, it's better than what they have. So from, from my perspective is keep our eye on the ball, you know, we, there's a lot of operational challenges that, you know, we've all of us have had to work through, you know, with COVID um, and we want to continue to improve uh, in that area and, and deliver to our retailers and, and, and continue growing them. And we've seen phenomenal growth. We'll continue to see it. It's now just about, about managing that growth and being selective and, mm -hmm. you know, the areas that we get into. Exactly. And I think like, you know, there's so much to say on this uh, that I'll, I would take up too much time because I want to make it more about asking you more, asking you questions, but better, better products win, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, better products win. And we're in a type of environment now with CPG that this whole pump and dump thing, you know, like, you know, um, just building up brands and then selling them, you know, really, really quickly um, or even over time and then not being profitable and just uh, scaling revenue at all costs and pumping all this money into marketing is a model that's becoming more and more rare. And I think, John, you mentioned it like COVID has accelerated this, right, where investors, acquisition companies, they're, they're all becoming more careful about who they acquire and they want to see profitability and sustainability in the company. So this is becoming um, more common, right? Where brands don't have to sell. They can become sustainable, be profitable, do a SPAC deal, mm -hmm. raise from the public, and then uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're off on your way. Um, and a really very quick side story, we had Chris Kirby, which if you haven't um, connected with him, you guys are like kindred spirits, John. He's the founder and CEO of Ithaca Hummus. I don't know if you ever had Ithaca Hummus. Oh, I've got four tubs of it in my fridge. <laughs> I figured, and you I know, make the my whole... own hummus. I make really good hummus myself, and I have four tubs of it in my fridge. That that speaks volumes, right? Where that's as, it's as close as you can get to like making it yourself. And they just launched in Sprouts, you know, and so I was able to find. Normally, I wasn't able to find it before, but now with Sprouts, I'm able to find it here in SoCal. And the quality, when you're talking about your story, using real parsley, real ingredients, real, you know, uh, real garbanzo beans, like, you know, 
they're doing a similar thing for, in the hummus space, and they may not be the cheapest hummus as far as price. They may not be in every gas, you know, every single store in the country, but they do great volume in the stores that they're in because they make a great product, and no one can touch them with a ten foot pole on quality. So that's what that's really what you're driving for. It might take a hell of a lot longer, but you're going to grow real value, you know, for your company, and not you're not battling on price. You're battling on qual. You're 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 just you're winning on quality instead of battling on price. So let's get into the WeFunder thing, okay? Because we you know we have WeFunder, we have Shark Tank. I want to focus on the WeFunder because part of the show is also focusing on things that other entrepreneurs um, want to get value from and they want to raise money. And I don't know about you, man. I've been getting a lot of people on LinkedIn asking me how to raise money on crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Have you been getting the same thing? I'm sure you have. I, I, yeah, I've I've been getting some of that. I've been getting you know people asking me to mentor them, and you yep. know, I've you know I've gotten, I've gotten a few of those. Yeah, yeah. I, I I was helping for free at first, but you know, as I quote, you know, the Joker from Dark Knight, like if you're good at something, don't do it for free. You know, so right. you know, but the, in, 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 in all seriousness, I didn't have enough time to mentor all these people, so I mentored I think ten or fifteen, and I realized I can't. I don't have enough time. So I started charging $500 an hour to do this. And I still get people that mm -hmm. want to get that advice. And 500 bucks an hour is like, to me, like, like, you know, nothing compared to the value you can get by raising hundreds of thousands, right, on, on, a, on a crowdfunding campaign. Tell us about your experience um, with WeFunder. Mm -hmm. we, we know that you just closed your campaign. So it's done. You were up for at least about six months. Tell us about the experience, how much you raised, the good, the bad, the ugly. I know there was some great stuff. There was some stuff that could have been better. Tell us, tell us your whole experience. I mean, overall, it was uh, it was a great learning lesson for us. It, they, one of the the good things about WeFunder is they provide the framework to really think about how you want to sell your company to investors. Um, and because we've had other meetings with, with, with VCs in the past, but this was different, right? And, you know, the team there uh, was early on was pretty hands-on with us in terms of asking questions and giving us, you know, guidance based on previous campaigns that have run on their, on their platform that were successful. And you take, you take that advice, you take those learnings and you apply it to your own campaign and, you know, what we put together, I thought was really, really polished and, and really presented to Da in, in the best possible way. And going through that exercise forced me, you know, to think about things differently and, and to, to, to articulate things in a way that I now use in, you know, some of our sales meetings. So from that perspective, it was really great. And it, and it gave us a platform, you know, when we went out to you know, within our own local network, because that's a big part of the WeFunder raise is they want you to reach out into your own personal network uh -huh. to, to kind of see the campaign. Uh, and the majority of what we raised was from our ne own network. Uh, and, and, and I don't think if, if it wasn't for WeFunder, I don't think we would have been able, I think there's a, a legitimacy that having a campaign on WeFunder gives a company, whereas, you know, you could be talking to something, you know, even though we're in business for 10 years, you know, and we're raising via safe and what's a safe. So they, they have all the back end mechanics down, right? They kind of make that as frictionless as possible for the investors. And so from that perspective, it's it's been amazing. Also, you know, great visibility, right, online. Mm -hmm. um, and you raised, uh, what was the total amount you raised on WeFunder? Uh, you know, a little bit over 750. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And it was, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, and so you have... Uh, how many, at least over, how many new investors, at least over a thousand, right? I imagine, or how many? No, because, no, because the majority of it was the, our own personal network. Oh, so wow. That was, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and those people invested at a, at high, high levels. Got it. Uh, at very high. Yeah. Got so it. yeah, well, I think our total in, investors, um, around 340 maybe total. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so with, with that. Um, would you do it again, right? If you needed to raise more money in the future, would you go back to crowdfunding? What are your thoughts on the experience of crowdfunding? <sighs> Raising money is a job in and of itself. Yeah. It's right? exhausting and disruptive. It, yeah. yeah, it's exhausting, but here's the thing. 
because of my New York upbringing, I have a very low tolerance for bullshit. I hate wasting time. I really do. And I prefer, because I have a family, I've got three kids, you know, they're active, soccer. I have my own life that I try to keep in balance because I know that this isn't a sprint, right? This is, this is, you know, I'm 10 years into it, right? And we're, I don't think we're anywhere near where we want to be, um, at least not for the, you know, for exit. And so for me, keeping my life in balance is really important. So I try to be really efficient with the time that I spend on work. And of mm -hmm. course it bleeds into late nights sometimes and, and weekends or, you know, taking phone calls on vacation, but I try to make a pretty good separation um, between, between the two, because I think it gives me balance. So when, fundraising as important as it is to a company's success, it's just not in my mindset, you know, and that makes me maybe not the best entrepreneur, right? In terms, in that regards, because I, I just, I rather fix problems, you know, on manufacturing, on the logistics, on the, you know, with our sales team, with the, you know, respond to customers and, and grow the brand, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I know fun is a big part of it. Um, would I do it again? I mean, it's hard to argue with what we were able to achieve. So yes, you know, I would do it again. Um, but there's a lot of great crowdfunding sites out there. So, you know, I, I would, I would be maybe open to, you know, exploring other, uh, you know, crowd, crowdfunding platforms. Um, but yeah, there's yeah, like, I think... there's, there's Republic, you know, like, you know, cause we did, we funder the first year or last year, mm -hmm. you know, we raised a less than you about a little under half a million. And then, uh, and then we, uh, went on Republic and we're, you know, hopefully getting to a million, you know? So there's like, I think, you know, the, the big takeaway is that like, you can raise more than once on there. And I think what used to be looked down upon, it used to be looked down on, maybe like three years ago, like, oh, you know, can't raise from a VC, you go on to crowdfunding. That has, that is out the freaking window now where it is a great way to raise money because you get yeah. exposure, it's marketing, it grows the brand. You know, I know that you had yeah. mostly a, an inner inner network of people that invested in Tada, but you also had maybe some from WeFunder that now know your brand, they're gonna buy the brand. Absolutely. They're gonna buy the product, I Absolutely. should say. So. And I, I do agree with you, you know, just from one entrepreneur to another, we want to focus on growth. And if we get mm -hmm. too mired in all the other things and do not focus on the big prize, because if there's no growth and there's no sales, it doesn't matter how much money you raise. <laughs> you know, if you don't have right. a great product, it doesn't matter how much money you raise. So you're focusing, I feel, on really core, critical, important buckets in the business. And usually yeah. if you're growing a brand that's sustainable, that's going to solve scale is going to solve a lot of your issues, right? Not raising money. Raising money doesn't solve all your issues, right? So, yeah. yeah. You don't want to be that guy. We all know that that guy or that woman <laughs> that perpetually fundraising. Raising, raising right? money. <laughs> raising money. Uh, what did you do last? Oh, yeah, you know, we, we lost, you know, 500 grand. Like, oh, okay. But I raised yeah. 5 million. Our, 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 <laughs> our burn rates too. Our burn rates too high. So we got we got to do a Series A or a Series B or a Series you know F whatever you know whatever. <laughs> series doing. F for so, uh, for F. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, when yeah, when you're doing that kind of, you're kind of like in the we you're kind of like in the WeWork uh, realm, right? You're just uh, exactly raising money and sustain your company. Um, and you know, people come and seek us out, right? And just the never aligned based on the size of where we are, what we wanted to do, you know, or or what the VCs were looking at in terms of you know their stake. Um, but there's going to come a time potentially where that's you know if you're growing and you're making you're taking ACV or you're taking market share from the incumbents, which is what we've been doing for years. Mm -hmm. um, people notice and they'll talk to you, right? You know, you don't have to go knocking door to door. Um, you know, to, to, to get that money if, if, if you're focused on the right thing. So exactly. people, people invest in a, in, a, in a strong growth story. So exactly. Yeah. If you grow the brand enough, take enough market share, ace, all these things you're talking about, eventually they come to you and you'll get a much better valuation. You're not the one being like, please, you know, like, you know, a lot of younger yeah. entrepreneurs, please invest in me. You know, it's like, I have a choice on who I want to be a partner and I'm going to get the right valuation because I've already proved, I've proven myself. Right. And right. speak, and your right. story speaks for itself. So it's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. So we, uh, we're out of time. I wanted to get into more of the Shark Tank stuff, but we'll do that maybe in a future episode, you know, maybe in the sure. somewhere in the 100s. We'll get you back on here for sure. Uh, but without sure. further ado, let's get to our next segment, which is called Rapid Fire Questions. 
rapid fire questions. All right. I know it's like here in Virginia right now, it is 7.48 p.m. our time, 10.48 p.m. Hopefully I'm not, I just had a mocha uh, genius. Hopefully I'm not too high energy because you're trying to, trying to taper down, right? For the next I know, you're fine, man. You're fine. I love the energy. Yeah. I love, <laughs> love it. it. I love great. It. Great. Okay. So let's do this. Bunch of questions, just like what Arnold Schwarzenegger says, I think, in Kindergarten Cop. I ask you a bunch of questions. I want a bunch of answers. So here, is. here we go. So, first one, in sync or Backstreet Boys? Tribe Call Quest. Cool. First person to answer, none of the two. <laughs> so, you're breaking records already here. First question already breaking a record. First thing you do when you wake up? Pray. Movie you can watch an unlimited amount of times? The Matrix. Love that movie. Oh, my God. But not the, not not any of the sequels, right? Only the first one. Yeah. Just the yeah. first one. Yeah, there, there are no sequels in my book. I, I only I watched them once in the theater, <laughs> and I never watched them again. To me, they were terrible. Yeah, same. Yeah. They were just making money. That's what they were there for. Um, song you can listen to an unlimited amount of times? Uh, anything from Lauren Hill. Got it. Is it a tribe, a tribe called Quest, tribe called Quest? Do they do? I left my wallet in San in San Diego in El Segundo. El Segundo. That, is that them? Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yep, yep, that's them. It popped out to me since we're right near uh, El Segundo. I'm in Redondo Beach, Manhattan. Manhattan Beach is literally one street over, across the way. Rosecrans, other side is El Segundo. Yep. I think I, I think I left my wallet over there. I got to check right after no. this. No. <laughs> so there's Zoom, an oil refinery in El Segundo actually yeah yeah i used yep. to, as a chemical engineer i used to i used to go to that oil refinery sorry oh really okay wow yeah cool yeah. it's a, a did you know moment here on 15 minutes of genius yeah. <laughs> all right that's right zoom microsoft teams or google meet which one do you like the most zoom got it did i ever i don't think i i skipped this one favorite sport to watch soccer love it what is your spirit animal My spirit animal, grizzly bear. Grizzly, uh, that one, that's so, that's so freaking right. So right. And the grizzled beer, beard just tops it <laughs> off right there. All right. Well, window seat or aisle seat on an airplane? Aisle. Peanut butter or almond butter or neither? Peanut butter. Omnivore, flexitarian, vegetarian, or vegan? Uh, omnivore and flexitarian are basically the same thing. So either one of those two. Got it. Cold weather or hot weather? Cold weather. A couple more here. We have uh, this one. I'm interested to see what your response is. I, I think I, I know which one. Uh, LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Come on. Michael Jordan. Yeah, exactly. All the way. Yeah. Uh, someone earlier said... Because, because, I mean, I'm 44. What am I supposed to say? If, if you ask someone who's you know, 34, they're going to say LeBron James. Exactly. Exactly. I'm 38 turning 39 and, uh, I, I could be 20 and, uh, I just, I would not forgive my younger self. If I said LeBron James, it's gotta be MJ. It's gotta be MJ. Uh, I mean, Ginger, LeBron's amazing. Yeah. No, nothing. I think LeBron's amazing. Can't take anything from him, but, um, you can't perfect perfection. Can't beat perfection. Yeah. Uh, except for when he played baseball for that one year, <laughs> but let's, <laughs> or, with, or with the Washington wizards yeah, or the Washington, Washington wizards. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. but we'll forget that those chapters, everyone has those chapters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like the one year with genius juice when we were trying to find a new source, a new place to make our product. So we lost shelf space for a year. We just kind of sweep that under the rug from 2016. All right. So ginger, yeah, ginger or turmeric. I mean, with sushi ginger, if I'm drinking a golden latte turmeric, so, yeah. so both. Know, it depends both. on the application. Yeah. So last question, favorite food or drink if you're stuck on a deserted island, you cannot say tada, you cannot say genius juice. What would it be? Favorite food or drink? For the drink, it'd have to be some type of flavored sparkling water. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be 
I think that'd be a good choice. For food, what can I eat all the time? I love those uh, Rhythm Nation cauliflower bites. I think they're those crunchy cauliflower bites. They're oh, so yeah. addictive. I can, I can eat like so many bags of those. Have I'm, you seen the one at Costco? Well, the big the big bag? I've got seven of them. I'm afraid that they're going to stop stocking it until it's going to go out of rotation. So <laughs> just like hoard it. <laughs> because it's so much more cost effective, yeah, even though they have other flavors. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just the one I, I would pick. I love no, that I, one. You know what I should pick? What? Ithaca hummus. Ithaca. Ithaca there hummus. you go. Shout out to yes, Chris. Their beet, their beet hummus tastes good on everything. And if I'm on a stranded island, I can take, literally take palm leaves and dip it in there. and I can get my fiber and make it taste good. Exactly. You could literally catch fish and then dip them into the yeah. hummus and it'll taste good. Yeah. 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 I'm going to switch my answer. Ithaca beat hummus. Okay. Ithaca. Dude, awesome, man. Awesome. All right. Well, that is rapid fire questions with John Sorial, <laughs> founder, right. managing partner, Tada Foods, Shark Tank alumni, we funder over 750K raised and growing and a seasoned entrepreneur. Thanks, John, for being on, man, sharing your story. Appreciate it, thanks and uh, thanks for staying up late until 11 o'clock at night, especially with three kids. So appreciate it, my man. No worries. They're, all, they're all in bed, so it's fine. Awesome. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, exactly. You're the last one to go to sleep in the household, I'm pretty sure. All right. So, uh, again, that was John Suriel, founder managing partner of Todd Off Foods. Great guy. Episode 93. Big plug to Mark Nicholas, Mark and ManhattanBeachStudios.net. It's going to get in the center here so that I can look good for the last part of the show. Uh, make sure to reach out to him. He's amazing. Want to have your own podcast, videos, audio, pictures. You know, he does photo shoots here. It's pretty amazing. Um, make sure to check out our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, also on LinkedIn. Check us out all over the place. We're on there. Coming up, we have episode 100. We're going to be announcing the guest shortly, so make sure to stay tuned for who that guest is going to be. Friend of mine and uh, awesome all-around guy in the CPG space. So uh, that is it. Uh, ribbon on top, episode 93. And one last thing, stay bing genius, my friends. Genius for life. Coconut smoothies coming at you. 